Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And you know what? I think this is going to be the last compilation I'll be able to assemble before the mid-year. That's going to be dropping in a couple of days. Please stay tuned for that. But now into the matter at hand. Let's get on the pulse. Before we go any further, if you would like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. These sort of compilations will not get shared out as much, especially with some of the uh, more obscure acts on this list, including some country, and that rarely gets out of the primary bubble. But hey, there's a lot here that I think is worth checking out, even if it's kind of a mixed bag. But now it's the matter at hand. We got eight projects on the docket. Let's start off with From Messer Them Arrival. All right, go into band camp with this one, into synth-inflected spacey black metal, and one of the more prolific two-man acts in this space from Australia. Now, for Messer Them, it's been a steady process to expand and enhance their production, along with keeping the melodies vibrant amidst the pummeling riffs and drums. And while I don't quite think this tops the sheer ear candy of 2020's The Degenerate Era, the glossy melodic hooks and the improved production balance really helps it sound cosmic and immense without the electronic trance or even some pop elements feeling a little too silly, even if good luck figuring out any of the lyrics amidst the howling. Now, some of the synths are a bit weedy for my taste, and it feels more stop and start than I would prefer. I like their tighter song focus, but the flow within the whole arrival segments is a bit jerky, but the closer, type 4, it is so glorious, it pretty much redeems everything. I had a ton of fun with this. It's potent stuff. I'd give it a shot. From Brandy Clark, Brandy Clark. Yeah, I'm late to this one. Brandy Clark is one of the most underrated singer-songwriters working near mainstream country, with a phenomenal voice and a great ear for composition, and even despite some muted buzz for this, she's got the track record to deserve more attention. And yet, this is a bit tough to gauge. It's self-produced, beautifully arranged, slow burn songs about love and loss that takes all the strings and heartbreaking layered romance and drama of her last album and turns the volume down to something near adult contemporary. It's mature, it's tasteful to a fault, where the murder ballad Ain't Enough Rocks that opens up the album almost feels out of place. It's by women, for women, about women loving women, be it platonic or erotic, a distinctive feminine lens and framing. Now, it is deliberately paced and ballad heavy. I get why some folks might be cooler on it, but it also does exactly what it's designed to do really damn well, so yeah, worth hearing. Check it out. From Jake Owen, Loose Cannon. All right, look, if there's someone I want to stick around past bro country, it's Jake Owen. He's upbeat, he's got a ridiculous amount of charisma, he doesn't take himself that seriously, and Joey Moy tends to do shockingly good work with him. Now, this is his first album in four years, and apart from being a little longer than it should be, it's remarkably easy to like this for lightweight summer material. It helps that Jake Owen is a bit more mature, with less trend chasing, sticking with more warm, neo-traditional tones, live drums, and pedal steel, and even if there are a couple songs that are impressively stupid, and Joey Moy can overproduce the vocals a bit more than I would prefer, there is some welcome self-awareness and getting older, dealing with the impacts of this lifestyle and all the women that he's left behind as a result. I wouldn't really call this great, but the deep cuts are really strong and mainstream country is just better with more Jake Owen. This is worth hearing. Give it a shot. From Victory Over the Sun, Dance You Monster to My Soft Song. So we're going to the dissonant, microtonal, complicated edges of black metal with this one-woman project from Vivian Tylenska, where imagine a lot of liturgies, avant-garde compositional whiplash, but with more focused lyricism, sharper progressive elements, and actual bass lines. Now there have been improvements in composition and production with each project, but now with this, I mean it can still feel kind of choppy, but it's easily her best to date. In between the tremolo shredding and both striking melodic swells and crushingly brutal passages that grind into the noise, the liquid prog segments accented by jazzy horn lines, accordion, and even synth breakdowns, to the lyrics full of agonized, ecstatic, transformative desire and apocalyptic beauty where the trans subtext feels tangible. I mean, it took a while to really click for me, but it is unlike anything else you're going to hear this year, and it's worth it. Great stuff. From Squid, O Monolith. 
So Squid's debut album got lost in the shuffle of 2021 for me. A lot of the competition left its solid, jittery experimentation and sharp writing, but missing some dramatic swell or personal touches behind. But now for the critically acclaimed follow-up that paired things back significantly for leaner songs, well, it's a much stranger listen, shedding many of its influences to feel like its own beast. A fusion of choppy, bass-heavy post-punk, modern synthetic glitch, and a very English brand of theatrical freak folk that reminds me of Richard Dawson. And that comes again in the lyrics, where late capitalist nightmares intersect with a pastoral but more mystical old England in a blur of animism and commodity fetishism, where dissociation towards objects of meaning is both questionable escapism and nightmare fuel, but humanity is always at the distance. I mean, I think I respect this more than I like it, so call it a cautious recommendation. From King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, Petra Dragonic Apocalypse. I mostly stopped covering King Gizzard a couple years ago, not because they make bad music, but a flood of solid but rarely great albums hitting the exact same themes just got kind of tiresome. But this is being pitched as following Infest the Rat's Nest, back to vintage thrash, classic metal full of chunky motorhead riffs, blazing solos, and underpowered grooves because the weirdly clean mastering and wonky drum mixing doesn't have the punishing impact it should. And while it was nifty conflating desperately using modern tech to save humanity from environmental apocalypse with pagan ritualism and magic. I mean, blind faith in either will not save us. Once you know that they're never going to expand on their apocalypse beyond increasingly goofy throwback fantasy, it's just hard to take it that seriously. Overall, if you're in the cult, you're going to have fun with this, but I've heard it done better before. Just saying. From Gunna, a gift and a curse. My issue with Gunna was that for all the liquid production and vibes, his content felt very interchangeable and his performances felt emotionally inert. The albums ran together, I just couldn't care about anything he said. But now with his messy involvement with the YSL case hanging over him and leaving many of his name producers and all his guest stars, Gunna really has to rap to salvage his career. And I'll be damned if this isn't his best album. Now it's far from great. It's a toss up whether he sounds realistically burnt out or just disengaged. When he goes back to his stock flexing and stealing your girl, it's way less interesting. But the production and especially the mixing feels a bit more refined and balanced and low key. And when he raps to explain the messy situation, I mean, it's the first time I've remotely cared about Gunna as a rapper. I mean, outside of his cases, I can argue Gunna saved his career with this album. He's not my demo, but I see his value. This is decent stuff. From Killer Mike, Michael. Look, what folks tend to forget about Run the Jewels is that they were always over-the-top firebrands, and if you read between the lines, their personal politics were always a bit more moderate, but with the modern Overton window letting in more left-wing views that are closer to RTJ, it can make Michael's center-right black capitalism feel a bit out of step with discourse, although much closer to the offline Atlanta reality. But paired with gospel and guest samples, alongside Killer Mike's deeply expressive storytelling, some of the reflexive conservatism it at least feels authentic and personal. It's not revolutionary, but there is some drive. I get the appeal. But away from all the politics, it is a swaggering, bass-heavy Atlanta rap album with some iffy production, a couple insane verses, and some tangible, if blinkered, empathy, especially around women. Also a little overlong and languid, and it's got some shaky hooks. Look, you're not always gonna like the flawed character here. I think there's enough character to recommend. It's decent. Give it a chance. So yeah, once again, thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. I will say again, I've got the mid-year video that's probably going to be dropping either June 30th or July 1st. So please keep an eye on socials or my socials if you want to be able to track when that is coming. Or turn on notifications if you want to be aware when that mid-year video drops. Beyond that, though, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in supporting the channel beyond, say, buying my merch or want to get albums onto my schedule or just argue with me more directly on my Discord, the link to my Patreon is right over there. The schedule will be reopening in early July, so I'd be happy to see you all come on board. Once again, don't feel obligated. Tough times, I understand, but the option's available. Until then... I'm Mark, you're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.